again, let me just say um, thanks for being with us this weekend, those in person and online. Um, don't forget, also, on Sunday evenings, we post what we call Weekend Thoughts online. It's on our website, also on our YouTube, Facebook page. Um, it's kind of um, just a little bit of a, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of a Bible study, if you will. Uh, just some thoughts about the weekend message. Um, so tonight, later on this evening, there will be a, just, it's usually anywhere between 10 to 17 minutes long. Um, but just kind of help us throughout the rest of the week just to keep our minds focused on in different things um, from that standpoint. So again, weekend thoughts, don't forget about that. Also, um, if you've been on our website recently, you'll notice that there's also a Kids Connect uh, video that's on there now. So actually, um, from the standpoint, whether you're traveling or you're on vacation or whatever that looks like for your family or whatever's going on, um, it's there now. Um, so there's a time of worship on our website now. Um, there's a time also for kids to worship. Um, so all that is there for us. Um, you might ask, say, why so much online? Um, my answer would be, why not? And from that standpoint. But it is the opportunity just to reach more and more people and to stay connected. You realize now, whether it be those that from a hospital standpoint or on vacation or family that maybe doesn't live in the area but still want to stay engaged as a church, um, those from a nursing home perspective or uh, whatever that looks like, um, can stay connected to the church. Um, so uh, all these resources are there for us to use. Um, so hopefully we're taking advantage of them and using them. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn in with me over in your Bibles, over to Revelation, um, the last book in the Bible, uh, Revelation. Um, we're going to look at and continue in our series, The Seven Churches. And we're going to look at the third letter, if you will, that was sent by Jesus. Now keep in mind, each weekend I invite us to actually be present in the area or the different part of uh, uh, the area or experiencing a miracle or in, in this case, in this series, that we are actually part of the church uh, that is receiving this letter. That we are part of Pergamum and we are there in the audience with, with the rest of the church of Pergamum listening to what is being read, what is being delivered. Okay, so let's just put ourselves there. And this church this weekend that we're looking at, over in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, is a very confused church. Now, as we prayed at the very beginning, we prayed for various things. Well, let me just add one more thing to your prayer list. Um, that would be Jenna, um, our youngest Jenna. The reason why I'm asking you to pray for her is because, here's the thing. I shared with you uh, a long time ago one of the messages that one of my ears doesn't work as well as the other. Anybody can relate to that in hearing? <laughs> so if I don't want to hear something, I will sleep on my good ear, sleep on my pillow. So therefore, there could be things going on around. It's great. It's awesome. But in a conversation standpoint, it can cause confusion at times. Well, Susan, every once in a while, her ears will get really stopped up. And so we are in this, I have one ear, it doesn't work really well, and Susan's ears are stopped up right now. So there can be some confusion in the conversation piece. So pray for Jenny. Because you, know, <laughs> uh, you never know what's being said. Anybody ever been confused? Uh, if, anybody willing to admit they're confused now? If you want to see confusion, come back tonight at 6 o'clock and watch everybody go for ice cream. See what confusing looks like. Well, this church at Pergram was confused. They were dealing with um, some issues that we're going to look at today. But the biggest thing they're dealing with when we talk about confusion is this idea of truth. And man, oh man, it's just amazing in preparation for this series how looking at the letters that Jesus sent to the various churches and how even in today's culture it still relates to the church and culture society that we are walking in right now. There's a lot of confusion about a lot of different things. And there's a lot of struggle with what does truth actually look like. You see, what I think is true versus what you might think is true can look really different. Even in this audience today, whether we want to admit it or not, we kind of adapt 
to that kind of thinking. And we struggle with what truth really looks like. Within the church, we struggle with truth. Why do you think there are so many different, amongst all the different, if you will allow in, in different religions and different things, although it, the church is not a religion, out of all the different, if you will, in, in a, there, there are more splits and more splinters and more things that have gone looking at the church than any other spiritual or religious thing. So you think from people looking in at the church trying to, we've talked about this before, trying to figure it all out. And they go, well, you know, you got this group here and you got this group here and this group says this. The struggle with the idea of truth. And now we bring that into culture. We bring that into life. And now I get what you think is true. I mean, again, we've talked about it. And you guys in ways have agreed at times that there's really no opinions anymore. It's just true. And if you don't want to take my word or my opinion as truth, then we kind of just can't have a relationship with one another. Or if we don't believe, we go the other street. If you don't believe what I believe, then we can't have a relationship with one another. Or you can't actually sit down and have a conversation about something that you disagree on. You just kind of got to go your separate ways. It's in culture, society, and it even makes its way into the church. And it causes a lot of confusion. And in a world and society, more that whether they realize or that Jesus really is the answer to life. All these various things, the things we prayed for earlier this morning, all these various things, the things that you're dealing with, whether you believe in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, Jesus really is the answer. Amen. He really is the answer to that. He's the answer to Afghanistan. He's the answer to the hurricane. He's the answer to what's going on in Haiti. He's the answer to the pandemic. He is the answer. Mm -hmm. But because of all these various things and the struggle to find truth, and because there's so many splinters even within the church of truth, it's hard for people to really see through all that to see Jesus. And that was what was going on with this letter that Jesus writes to today that we're all a part of. We're all sitting in this church at Pergamum. And it says, write this letter to the angels of the church at Pergamum. This is the message from the one with a sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where, get this, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his what? Throne. As his throne. Well, we're all in the audience now. We're sitting in the church listening to this. Yet you have remained loyal to me. You see, here's Jesus. We talked about this multiple times in this letter. What does Jesus do? He builds them up. He builds us up. He comes in and he, says, he, he pats us on the back. He says, you know, you're doing this. He says, you remain loyal to me. You refuse to deny me. Even when Antipas... My faithful witness was martyred among you there in Satan's city. He says it again, Satan's city. But then he says this. But I have a few complaints against you. There it is again. Yeah, you were talking about it. You ever had someone come in and say, man, you're doing an awesome job. But. but. <laughs> you know? In fact, a lot of times now we will eat someone, we, we kind of, we don't take, we'll take the, the, the positivity that's coming from someone, but then we, we automatically, automatically go to the idea that, okay, there's going to be a but that's going to come to you. Jesus says, but I have a few complaints against you. Here are the complaints. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have uh, some from the Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin. Now, either circle that, underline that, put a box around that, highlight that, write it in your notes. It says, repent of your sin. Or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand that he, what he is saying to the churches, okay, must understand. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand. Let that sink in for a second. What he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give each one a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who received it. <clears throat> what I want to do is I just kind of want to break this down and kind of just talk about what do we do with confusion? What do we do with confusion in our own lives? And what do we do with confusion within the church? How do we just bring all this together? So let me encourage you again. Take notes. Even if you're not taking notes, make me think you're taking notes. So later on, I will just think, wow. Okay? Everybody's taking notes. So just even, or, 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 or at least punch the person beside you and say, take notes for me. No. Something like that. Okay? So how do we do this? How do we deal with confusion and truth? And what is all this like? The first thing is this. Say power for me. Power. There is power in his word. There is power in his word. See, two times in this passage, we, it actually talks about the sword that is coming out of his mouth. It's a picture of power. It's the idea of a sword coming out of the mouth. Is again, is a picture of God's word and how it acts in our lives. See, at the beginning of the book of Revelation, Jesus talked about, uh, uh, look, in fact, look what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. It says this, in his hand, he held the seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. The sharp sword of God's word. There, there, there's, there's, some, there's, a, there's some things I want to just draw our attention to for this. One of them is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. It says, Accept God's salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Envision going into battle. And you take your sword. We take our sword. What's our sword? The sword is the Word of God. It's the word of God. It's going into battle against Satan with the word of God. Now again, we've talked about this multiple times. It doesn't mean, you know, a lot of you know the word of God. I'm sure a lot more than I know the word of God. It's not a matter of, again, we beat ourselves over the head and we, we don't engage in the Word of God because we've tried over and over again and we don't understand this and we don't understand that. And then Satan comes in and he weaves that little lie in there that, hey, you're never going to get this. You're never going to understand it. Oh, you don't have time to spend time in God's Word. That's just one more thing you got to add to your task list. That's one more thing you got to do. So we think in our minds, well, so we just don't engage at all. It's a matter of just being in God's word. And now in today's society and culture, there are so many different ways that we can engage in his word. Listening to it. Reading it. We got smart devices. You got your phone now. You got... Um, Computers, all these different ways that you can engage in God's Word. Me, I preach from an iPad. Why do I preach from an iPad? Because as I've gotten older, my eyes don't see the way they used to. And I don't want to have a Bible up here this big uh, for me to be able to see the Word. So I use my iPad. 
So we say, well, I can't see the words anymore. My grandmother years ago, she was so, uh, there was a different, there was people within the church that were a little upset because they got away from hymns and they were using uh, the screens and all that. And anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and they went to screens and all this. People got upset. because And my grandmother, bless her little heart, she was a little fiery at times. She just looked at, there was a group behind her. She's getting ready for worship. A group behind her, she just turned around and said, you all just need to be quiet. <laughs> For years, you've been making me sing out of this small little book, and I can't see a thing. Now the words are up there, and I can sing to my little heart's content. <laughs> so we have no excuse now. I want to make excuses, but we have no excuse. One more thing, we don't have no excuse for not being able to take the gospel to the entire world. Because now we have the ability to get the word of God there in so many different ways. The sword that we have to take with us into battle. Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is living. Say living for me. Living. Living. It's living and active. And sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even, even dividing the soul and the spirit Joins, jo joins in marrow. It, it, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Now, this passage of Scripture is talking about us. This passage is dealing with us. It's not talking about all oh, that the, the, the sword of God is living and acting and sharper than the devil. It penetrates. It's not talking about penetrating into Satan. It's talking about penetrating us. Penetrating straight to our ideas, to our theology, to our motives, to our thoughts. It has the power to sort out. It's living and it's active. See, Jesus came to this church that's struggling, it's confused, it's struggling with truth. And he starts by talking to them. He talks to them about being in the Word. He talk, he's, he's basically saying, saying and he's looking at said, in other words, you know better. You know better. In fact, you used to stand on truth. But now you have given in to other things that we're going to look at in a minute. Because here's the thing. Number two is this. Recognize. Say recognize for me. Recognize. Recognize the danger. Recognize the danger that there is and that, that comes about from lies. Do you have the ability to be able to recognize a lie? See, Jesus is talking about, he's talking about these lies that have begun to creep their way into church. And now it's starting to divide. It's starting to separate. People are starting to think through. They're starting to doubt. See, one of the things, if you notice here, that Jesus actually commends them for is that they had been standing on the truth. They had stood amongst the persecution, even watching someone that was actually died for their belief in Jesus, and they still were standing on truth. But we see there were starting to be these belief systems that from the culture that were starting to make their way in. And it was affecting them. One of these ideology was actually coming about um, was trying to fit into the culture and society. How do we fit in? How do we fit in? How do we make this work? See, during this time, everybody was being asked to worship Caesar. So the Christians, the church would be asked, why don't you bow to Caesar? Well, because we worship Jesus. So there was this thing. So what, what does that look like? It, you know, can we actually do both? Can we, can, we actually, uh, can we actually give our allegiance to Caesar and also give it to our allegiance to Jesus? What does that look like? 
So the church was struggling with it and this whole idea. Why don't Christians do it this way? Why do y'all do it this that way? Everybody would go to the different temples to get healed, but the people, but Christians, the church wouldn't do it that way. Why don't you do it this way? So, as you can see, so much what happens even in our culture today, it makes its way, weave its way in. How do we fit in? It's the lie we struggle with even in our world today. It deals with this inclusive lie. Why don't you just fit in and let, let's just include everybody. Why don't we include everybody in heaven? Why don't we just include everybody in salvation? Now, I realize this might not be easy to accept and hard to hear. There lies the confusion. Anybody on Facebook? Anybody? Now you're not going to be willing to admit. What are you going to say about Facebook? So you're not going to look. Anybody on Facebook? I was on Facebook until either I got shut down or hacked. I'm not sure. <laughs> now I'm on every other social media. Okay? So I'm not going to attack social media. But if you go on and if you see different things, you say, well, why well, see? Well, someone just got their wings. Anybody ever seen that? Well, I'm not sure if they got their wings or not. Well, first of all, we know they didn't get wings because we know that when you die, what? We've already talked this before. Angels and you know humans are de created differently. Angels are created beings as well. So that's a sermon for another time. That's for another wild night that we'll talk about. But you see what we do. We we so often we want to include everybody, and I realize that's so hard to do. I realize it's hard to sit there, it's hard to preach, it's hard to teach, it's hard, it's people, because of so many different things and confusion, it's hard to understand. You know, we talk about that as the church, we talk about it as a follower of Christ, that Jesus is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, that no one can come to the Father except what? Through him. Through him. But it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that. It's hard. So, therefore, again, why don't we just fit in? We needed Jesus to do what he did on the cross in order for salvation to be real in our lives. So here's the thing. The Roman government, they would try to get Christians, they would tell them, they would say that they, the Roman government was okay with them saying that Jesus is Lord. They just wanted them to say Caesar is Lord as well. You can say Jesus is Lord all you want. You just gotta say Caesar is Lord too. And the church was saying, we're not gonna do that. So that was the struggle again. We hear things today like, man. Jesus is the way. You know, we talk about salvation. And we hear things like, well, that's so inconsiderate. It's so narrow-minded. You're showing, you know, you're not showing any love or compassion when you talk of that way. People will say. But here's the thing. Why did God send his son if we don't need him? Why was Jesus born in a manger? Why did he leave heaven to come amongst his creation if we don't need him? Why did Jesus die on a cross if it's not important? Why did he shed his blood if we don't need forgiveness? See, we struggle with these things even today. Try to make it so we fit in. There's also this popular lie that it made its way in the church. Uh, a group called the Balaamites. 
It was this teaching, if you will, if you go back and you read through numbers, and it's amazing uh, just uh, to read back and to see what all was transpiring again, the understanding of truth and how it just all fits together. But Balaam had this conversation with Balak, the king of Moab, Moab. And he said, I can't curse them, but I'll tell you what, if you really want to get under the split, under, uh, under uh, God's, uh, uh, you will, if you want to, want to get God's attention, you really want to get God upset, then here's what I would do to the Israelites. Send some pretty women into the country and, and allow them to dance and flaunt themselves. They're going to entice them. They're going to intermarry with one another. And there'll be sexual relations with one another. And there'll be uh, idols that will be made, and, they, and, and they, as they intermarry and all this, they start worshiping the idols of false gods. This will upset God, and he'll take care of everything for you. And if you look at numbers, you'll see that's exactly what transpired and took place. So how was this lie making its way into church? Well, it was the lie of pleasure. It was the lie of pleasure that it made its way in. But then there was also this other ideology that makes made way in. The Nicolaitans had, uh, and their ideas were, were, were sort of like the, this other belief system in a way. They entangled one another. But here's the thing. All three of these, if you will break them down and, and spend some more time with it, they all dealt with relationships. They all dealt with relationships. Do you guard your relationships? Let me ask this. Do you guard who pours into you? Are you searching for, we've talked about this multiple times, but are you searching for ideologies or ideas or opinions or suggestions from whomever ever is willing to give? Or do you guard that? Do you protect that? I am leery of, I, I, I'll just tell you up front, I listen to those more that I know that are putting, if, if they're making a suggestion to me or, you know, in the, you know, as you, you all know, as you're parenting and different things like that, people come along, well, I would do it this way. I think you're, I can't believe you're doing that. <laughs> it happens to all of us, whether parents, grandparents, whatever. But I'm a little leery unless I know that when someone comes and they're giving a little opinion or advice and different things, if I know that they are actually lifting me up into the throne room of God and they're lifting up my marriage and my children up, I'm more apt to listen to them than I am to someone that just flippantly that I meet in a store somewhere that says, hey, you need to get your child up on the floor, which I might need to. <laughs> you know where I'm going at? I'm being a little sarcastic. So often we're, we'll post something, we'll put something out on social media. What do y'all think I should do about that? Really? Satan chooses to do that is through relationships. It's through relationships. The Bible actually tells us to be so careful and to be careful and to be on guard about our relationships. Here's number three. Don't encourage. I love that this is uh, this is actually good. I like this one. Don't encourage false teaching. Don't encourage false teaching. First Timothy chapter six verse five says this: Anyone who has a who has a different teaching does not agree with the true teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that shows the true way to serve God. This person is full of pride and understanding understands nothing, but is sick with a with love for arguing and fighting about words. Let that sink in for a minute. 
This brings jealousy and fighting and speaking against others, evil mistrust and constant quarrels. What is the motivation behind false teaching a lot of times? What is it? It's pride, fear, it's, it's arrogance, it's, it's the idea that I want to win. Now, can I go to Medlin? Can you let me do that just for a second? I don't know what Medlin is, right? Mm -hmm. Can I do that? Anybody like to, you don't have to raise your hand. Anybody just like to argue? Huh? Don't look to the first seat right or left. <laughs> look straight ahead. Anybody, you know what I'm talking about? Everybody just like, they just like to argue. I mean, they're automatically going to pick a fight. Anybody, you know, you know anybody like that? That's what we're, that's kind of what we're dealing with here. We've all got probably involved in arguments. We've probably all got involved in discussions. But here's the thing. Some people are actually driven by that. Some people are actually, to the idea, specifically with false teaching and all that, we meet people, we want to share Christ with them, that our, the, the motive behind it is pure, but the idea about it is that if I argue with them enough about something in Scripture, about their ideology, their beliefs, or something like this, if I, if I just argue with them enough, that they will eventually come to my way of reasoning. I mean... It's just, if you look at all the various different churches and all the different splinters of different churches, all that, just drive let's just say, from, from Marsville to here. Look at all the different churches. Think about it. Think about that. And then all of it deals with the fact that, hey, if you come to my way of thinking, well, I'm not going to. In other words, actually sitting down with one another and actually having discussions with one another. And realization is this funny. I found out down through my young 51 years of age, instead of arguing about or coming to the point where you disagree about, is coming to where, what are the common ground? What can you build from, from the common area where you're at? Jesus. Jesus. But a lot of times it doesn't look that way. So instead of what we do is bring them over our side, what we do is we just we just pour more gasoline on the fire. We just we we, we invite that type of thing. Titus 3, verse 9 and 10 says, But avoid foolish con controversies. About genealogies and arguments and quarrels about law, and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Anybody have that in their Bible? No, it's not there, y'all. Y'all done ripped it out. Huh? This is Titus three nine ten. It says quarrels about laws because they are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. Is that in anybody's Bible? Check it. See how serious God takes this? My mom and dad used to quote to me quite often Proverbs 12 1. You know what Proverbs 12 1 says? This is the version they quoted it to me. Proverbs 12, 1. Those who love instruction are intelligent. Those who hate instruction are stupid. <laughs> Those who love instruction are intelligent. Those who hate instruction are stupid. There's so much that we can learn from one another. There's so much we can learn. Sometimes we're so determined to be right. Sometimes even with the church, in the church, we're so determined to be right that we are wrong. Do 
Because the fourth thing is, is that we hold on. As we're doing, how do we deal with confusion and this idea of truth and all that? Is that we hold on. Look what Jesus says. He, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give a white stone with a hidden name that only you know what's written on it. Now, if you remember, manna was what? Remember, the manna was what? The children in Israel, that they, that they would eat in the wilderness that God provided for them. God sent them the manna. And it would meet their needs for that time period. So anyone who was Jewish, anyone with an understand, would have an understanding of this. And some of the manna, if you remember, if you go back and understand, some of the manna was put, actually put away and then put in the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the temple. In other words, this hidden manna. In the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go in. There's multiple miracles that took place when Jesus said it is finished. When he said it was done. When Jesus spoke the words on the cross and said, it is finished. One of the miracles that took place was that the veil that separated in the temple, which so many of you know this, but we forget. This veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. See, before, if you wanted to, you would go and you would go to the high priest, and the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go in there. When the veil was torn from top to bottom, when Jesus saying it was finished, he's saying it's finished in so many different levels. One of the levels is he's saying it's finished. In other words, there no longer will be a separation between man and God. That you and I, we don't have to go to a high priest to ask for gifts. We go before the great high priest. We go before Jesus. And have our sins forgiven. The hidden man. Jesus. In the Holy of Holies. Jesus at the right hand of God on our behalf, on your behalf, on my behalf. In just a moment, we're all going to take part in what we do every weekend in communion. Whether it be online, I would encourage you to do this online or here in person. We take part in communion. We take this little cup. It represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. We take that bread. It represents the body that was bruised and battered for us. That we no longer have to go to the high priest. But we can go to the great high priest. We can go to Jesus. See, it all starts with Jesus. The truth starts with Jesus. I'm going to pray. And then I want to just encourage you. Hopefully when you came in this weekend, you got a little cup and some bread. Just take some time in doing what Jesus asked you to do. He says, often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Maybe for you, you have questions, and, and I want to just encourage you to don't leave here. But just thinking, well, this is this is not a place again. I can ask my questions. Come back tonight. We're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. See, here's the thing. Let me just say this. I'm going to ruin that one for a second. Church should be the safest place on earth. Amen. It should be the safest place on earth. <coughs> where you can take, a, where you can remove all the masks, and I'm not just talking about a mask that we wear for the pandemic. I'm talking about, you know, we, we, from society and culture, we all have masks. I got to look this way for this person. I got to look this way for my family. Church should be the one place in the whole entire world where you are safe to be what God created you to be. 
You see, that's what the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's what the resurrection does. And that's what we'll remember this week. So maybe you're tired of carrying all those masks. You're tired of carrying all the lies. You're so confused. Maybe you just want to gather around the stage and spend some time in prayer. I'll be right down in front. I'll pray with you. You can take some time to talk. Maybe you say, you know what? I want to be baptized. I want to be immersed. You want to do that this weekend? What decision are we going to make? Let's pray. God, I thank you again for the opportunity to be in your presence. I thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you'll give us discernment and wisdom. Father, I pray that you will give us understanding where we that's needed, but I pray that you will also give us the trust to know that there's so many that have so many questions. And Father, it's okay, one, that we can't answer those questions, and it's okay, two, to have the question. Father, I thank you for all that you have blessed us with and all that you have given to us and what you do for us. How you make yourself known in so many different ways. Jesus, I thank you so much for going to the cross for me and for those here and those that I do life with on a day-to-day -day basis. And all throughout your creation. Jesus, I want to thank you for saying it is finished. I thank you for going to the grave. And oh, I thank you that you rose from the dead. I thank you for the precious gifts that we have. I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us to discern and to understand and, and to pray on my behalf when I don't know what to pray. Father, may you lead us this weekend. May you, we allow you to fill this place this weekend. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.